About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison. And this is the clause that makes the whole sermon today. But earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. But earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and centuries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and he woke him saying, get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. Apparently Peter's seeing this and no one else is. Stop being discouraged when other people don't see what you see. Don't be discouraged when God shows you things that others do not see. The prerequisite for being God is not that everyone sees it. Keep going. And the angel said to him, dress yourself, put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. But when they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened of its own accord. Imagine your first century walking out of a prison like you and me walk out of a mall. The automatic doors open before you. And they went out and they went along one street and immediately the angel left him. Now, when Peter came to himself, he said, now I'm sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. Now, this is like a micro church. There's a little micro church taking place and they're having their little micro church meeting and they're praying for Peter. And when he knocked on the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came and answered. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it's his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. Let's pray. Jesus, amaze us again. Amen. 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 Slap someone high five. And have a seat. It's difficult to not be impressed in the first century with Herod. Herod. The name Herod was an intimidating name. The name Herod pulled the swag that a name like Bush, Obama, or Clinton might possess today. Herod was not just one person. There were actually multiple Herods. Even to this point, there's been multiple Herods in the scriptures. Maybe you've heard of Herod the Great. Herod the Great was the Herod that was in power when Jesus was coming to be born, and he committed what was known as the Massacre of the Innocents. He killed many innocent children that were being born for fear that there would be a king of the Jews that would be born because he considered himself the king of the Jews. This was Herod the Great. He was, he was coming toward the end of his rule when Jesus was rising. He was pretty great indeed, not just in his power, but his architectural prowess was substantial. He built many things. He would use slave labor to create mountains, which is why you could, you can imagine when Jesus said things, it's really actually interesting because of as much power as Herod has. It's had, it's fascinating how little Jesus even acknowledged him. The few times he did would be times when there would be something like a great mountain. If you've ever read where it says, if you've got faith like a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea. Probably Jesus was referring to a mountain that Herod had built himself. The very mountain that Herod would build, that he would bury himself, let himself be buried in when he passed away. Herod was, Herod the, this was a great, 
great man that had, had rebuilt the temple of Solomon and, and its splendor and became one of the wonders of the world. And yet, interestingly, Jesus never seems to acknowledge Herod at all. It doesn't even give him the time of day except to acknowledge that if you've got little itsy-bitsy faith, that that'd be enough to throw his big works into the sea. That was Herod the Great, massacred innocence. His son, you can put those little pictures, his son, Herod Antipas, he's the one that killed John the Baptist. That when John the Baptist <laughs> said, hey, you just stole your brother's wife, you can't do that. To which the brother's wife said, I want John's head on a platter. And he got that when she got her daughter to dance in front of Herod and please all the guests and, and said, I want to kill John. So Herod Antipas kills John the Baptist. Well, this is now Herod Agrippa. This is the grandson of Herod the Great who determines to go ahead and keep that generational curse of murder going. And, you know, between Herod the Great and Herod Antipas, now here he comes. Herod Agrippa would be the grandson. And he has now killed the first of the apostles, James, who's now been killed. And that got him some some swag with the Jews, which was kind of a big deal because this line of rulers, although they were ruling Palestine, they were ruling the part, the Jewish part of the Roman Empire, they had this little inferiority complex of sorts because they weren't full-fledged Jews. They were half-breeds. Here the greats um, parents, one was Jewish, one was Gentile. And so there was this, this reality that like one rabbi named Simon back in the day actually ra- rose up an insurrection. Not an insurrection, but they would go off and they marched so that they could have demonstrations letting everybody know that, that, that Herod was not permitted, that he should not go into the temple to worship because he was not really a Jew. He, he, he kind of wanted to have the best of both worlds. And he said, no, this is not a guy that's, this is not a faithful Jew. He shouldn't be there. So there was all always this little stigma that the Herods had that they weren't quite Jewish enough. And yet when he kills James, he's getting some swag with the other Jews. So he's like, well, this is a good idea. Let me go ahead and bump this up a notch. And so now he's taken Peter. And that's where we stand there, where he's got Peter. He's, he's in this cell. And if you call the little details of this, it says they bring him into this prison. They bring him, there's four squads of soldiers to guard one man. They've got him in this place. He's shackled between two people. He's in this place. He's got chains on both hands, guards on each side, sentries on the outside, locks all around, to which the question might be, well, why would he do all of this? And the answer is, because if you've read the book of Acts till this point, Peter is already (laughs) very good at being thrown into prison and getting out. God's already got him out a couple times, all right? God's already getting him. He's got him out of prison. So here he is again now. Herod decides to go ahead and do a kingly flex and say, well, maybe he got out of other prisons. There must be some natural explanation for that. I will ensure with my power and my strength that he will not get out of prison. So he's got guards, chains, locks, sentries. He's got all of this stuff. And yet we're about to find as we come to this place, there's this little clause in verse 5. It says, but earnest, earnest, earnest. In NIV, it says constant, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now, I do not want to make too much of this, but I do not want to miss this because it makes it clear that James gets arrested and killed, and there's no mention of prayer. Peter gets arrested and gets released, and it's going out of its way to let us know that earnest prayer is being made on his behalf. I'm not trying to read more into this, but I do not want us reading less into this than what is going on there. What I want you to understand is that there's this earnest prayer that's taking place in the writer of Acts, who is Luke, is clearly trying to let us connect the the dots on a cause and effect relationship between what happens when God's people pray earnestly and what actually happens on the earth. Let me sum this entire message up in one sentence. History belongs to prayer warriors. History belongs to prayer warriors. And where I want us to go in this chapter, which kind of reads like a battle, but it's the power of Herod versus the power of God. And guess who wins every single time? So so let's kind of break this down. The first thought here is, is this. In verse 1, we see that Herod has, has done his thing, and Herod has uh, killed James, and he's now imprisoned Peter. And if you're watching this and you're worried of what's about to happen, here's the first thing I want to let all of you 
potential prayer warriors know. I wanted to say this. Stop being impressed with Herod. We humans, ever since the Garden of Eden, have had this bent toward hero worship. We, we love rock stars, and we love musicians, and we love politicians, and we, we, we love celebrity pastors, and, and we love athletes, and, and we love, oh, oh I just want to say, stop. I, I know Herod sounds impressive, but I, I want to point out the obvious right now. When I, mentioned, when I gave you your little Herod lesson, how many of you knew very little about the lesson I just gave you? Kind of wave at me. That's that's most everyone in here probably did not know many of the details of Herod. And yet in Jesus' day, Herod was the man and Jesus was obscure. And yet 2,000 years later, can I just go ahead and point out, Herod is virtually forgotten and Jesus is the king of glory. <laughs> Stop being impressed with Herod's. There's always been Herod's competing for our hero worship and our intimidation. Saddam Hussein asked one of his servants one day, what time is it? And he was a little intimidated by the question. He said, King, it's whatever time you say it is. Because when you've got power on this earth, we tend to use it for manipulation, intimidation, and all sorts of other things. And yet the Herods of this world, they always pass away. There's so many Herods. When you think of the, the Kennedys or the Kardashians, when you think of the, the, the Rockefellers, and, and, and I was just even this week kind of looking at who are the power families of this age now, where you had Herod the first and the second and the third, and there was a fourth, and, and you have this, this line, and they look so impressive. One of the books of the Bible that I most enjoy reading is the book of Daniel. Because the book of Daniel, you've got this nobody slave named Daniel, who is probably a eunuch who's been sold, and or he, his, the people of Israel have gone into what's really become slavery, and, and yet he makes his way up into this kingdom. And there are three kingdoms that Daniel lives in. And when the first one rises up, he shows himself faithful. God's favor is with him, and he gets rewarded richly with riches and honor and position and power. Well, one king rises, and that king dies. And gets overtaken by, and a second kingdom comes, and the same thing happens again. While the kingdoms of this earth pass away, the kingdom of heaven, there's this thread that the kingdom of heaven does not need any kingdom on this earth. By the way, you, I, I need us all to know this, that the kingdom of heaven doesn't need Greenhouse Church, doesn't need the Democrat Party, the Republican Party, it doesn't need Mike Pats, it doesn't need you. The kingdom of our God and King will reign forever, blessed be his name. <laughs> And Daniel rises up and, and this happens. And I, I love it when you get to the third batch. But, but there's this one line that keeps, it's a refrain that comes in Daniel over and over again that's, that's really just worthy of chewing on and meditating on for like 30 minutes straight. But he, he basically says, listen, there, there's all these kingdoms of this earth. But there is the God who is the most high God rules over the affairs of earth. And he gives the power to whomever he wishes. The most high. In Spanish it's altissimo. The Altissimo, the most alto, the most Altissimo, the Altissimo rules over the affairs of men. And he gives out the, he can give the power wherever he wishes. And I love it because when you get to the third episode in the life of Daniel, the king is very impressed with Daniel's wisdom and his knowledge and his prophetic abilities. And he offers to give him a, a bunch of money. And I love where Daniel, he says, king, keep your money. It's really a beautiful scene. He's like, I saw a king rise up and he promised me money and he gave me money. Now, by the way, just to give you a little parenthetical how rich Daniel became, scholars tell us that Daniel probably amassed massive fortunes from these kings giving him money. Well, how do we know this? Daniel was also known as, just to connect some little Christmas dots with you, Daniel was also the leader of what we would call the wise men or the magi. magi. Daniel amasses quite a amount of money that he probably invests very wisely. And they tell us that he probably passed this down, that this was being passed on through the wise men, one day looking for a star that was going to come, for a Messiah that would be there. And they would want the wise men to be able to show up with a nest egg of things to be able to give and to lay before a Messiah that was going to come. So that when the Messiah comes, and Herod, the great, is going to massacre all the children. Let me just connect all these dots. When he's wanting to do that, 
they would need an exodus to go hide out in Egypt to be able to go there, live there in a new place before they could come back, live in Nazareth where he's going to come and do his ministry. All I'm trying to let you see is this. Probably Daniel takes his loot, passes it down generation after generation. Jesus is born. The wise men come. They bring it to Joseph and Mary, give them this money. And of course there was gold and frankincense and myrrh. We don't know how much, probably enough to be able to go and take care of Jesus. All came from the riches, la riqueza, of this guy Daniel, who by the end of his life, when he's being offered more, he's like, king, you can keep your money. Your money is so unimpressive to me because I know what you're like, Nebuchadnezzar. I know what you're like, Artaxerxes. I know what you're like, Xerxes. I know what you're like. And you feel, Cyrus, you can fill in the blank. Stop being impressed with whatever Herod is going to work with you. Stop being impressed with the Herods that you read about in the news when you go to CNN and you see another Herod rise up. Let me break the Herods down for you. The Herods were... The angels say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Who was? And is. And here's the song you can sing about Herod. Herod's were. Pretty weak song, don't you think? Herod were. <laughs> Number one, stop being impressed with Herod. A history belongs to the prayer. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get there. History belongs. See, some people are impressed with horses, and some people are impressed with chariots, and some people are impressed with 401ks, and some people are imp impressed with political power. So, David would say, some trust in horses, some trust in chariots. We trust in the name of the Lord of hosts. Number two, start being impressed with God. Stop being impressed with Herod. Start being impressed with God. Peter's being prayed for by the church. Now Herod was about to bring him out that night. Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. Centuries before the door guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stands next, shines a light that Peter sees, but no one else sees it. He struck him on the side because he wasn't getting up yet. He's waking him up. He wakes up. Peter doesn't wake up the two guards that are chained to him. How did he do that? I do not know. What I know is that God can do what you and I do not know. I know some of you right now are in situations that you would say, this is impossible for Herod. Mike, this is impossible for a doctor, for you. But you and I are not alone. Which is why the refrain of the scripture constantly is, estoy contigo. I am with you. I'm with you. If it was just you, bummer. It's not. The light shines, strikes Peter on the side, wakes him, get up quickly, and they start to walk out everywhere they turn. No one's waking up. The doors are opening on their own. Friends, I need you to understand, God is able to do immeasurably beyond everything that you and I can think or behold or imagine according to the power that's at work in us. Start being impressed with God. I want you to tap into that power today. I was, at a, I, I was on a plane, and I was getting on this plane, and everyone saw this very famous. I'm not even going to say who it is because I don't want to be, I don't want to make anyone upset or get sued. And so I'm on the plane with this person. I'm getting ready to go in there, and, and I ended up right next to them. They were sitting, in, they were going to sit in first class. I was sitting with the, the peasants in the back, but... But they were there, but I, but I got to be right next to them. And of course, when they were about to sit down, they're like making a commotion and, they, and they're turning around and they're getting all there. And so everyone's stopping for them to get settled in first class. And I got to see this person up close. Now, all I got to tell you is that when I saw them, I'm like, you don't look nearly as good up close. <laughs> I was like, man, it's amazing what $100,000 in a Photoshop program can do for someone on a magazine cover. I was like, you look like the rest of us. I mean, I didn't say that, of course. I was just like, well, hello. But they didn't respond, of course. <laughs> and I was looking at them, and they, were, and they really were. They were rude. They were cold. They wouldn't give anybody the time of day. And they were very unimpressive up close. It's so interesting how humans can be, their, their pomp, and, and their clothes, and their makeup, and their photoshopping. We, people can look so impressed. The interesting thing about humans is that the closer you get to them, the less impressive they become. 
What's interesting about God is that the closer you get to him, Allah, the angels, we know about this because they stand before, they sit, they kneel before his throne. When the angels get close, what they say is holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. In other words, the people, the, the beings that get the closest to God, when they get close to God, when they get up close and personal, when they're standing by him in line to get on the plane, when they get close, there is this one word that gets used because it's the only one that works. Because you could say beautiful, holy means the most beautiful. You could say intelligent, holy is the most intelligent. You could say, you know, um, compassionate. He's more compassionate, more merciful, more understanding. He's got more of anything. The only appropriate word when you get to the top of that pyramid, the lone word that suffices is holy, holy. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And when they get close, they apparently, it says they say it night and day because you keep on realizing, recognizing new aspects of God. And you you name the aspect. Oh, that man is very compassionate. Or that woman, she's got a beautiful voice. Or or this person is in incredibly graced in this area. Friends, any beauty, the, the most, if you've seen the Grand Canyon, if you've, if you've ever looked at the, the oceans, if you've ever heard the most beautiful cry of a baby or watched a mother with her newborn child, you name the beauty, the experience, the glory, the grandeur at the top of it all, you would see God and realize all of it was pointing to him. Let me, let, me do, let me just do a little like praise break for a second here. Let me read you a couple scriptures to, to remind us to be impressed with God. Psalm 97.5 says, The mountains melt like wax in the presence of the Lord. Psalm 147 says, Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. 1 Chronicles 29.11 says, Yours, I love this, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and on the earth is Yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Can we get a little more thinking along these lines of God? Yours is greatness and power and glory and victory and majesty and beauty. You fill in the blank. Holy, holy, holy. I love this one. Jeremiah 32. Ah, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. Nothing is too difficult for you. That means it is appropriate, one of you that's in a meeting this week that you go into that feels difficult and you don't know what's going to happen and you don't, no one even knows what you're saying, but under your breath, you might just go, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Your boss might get up and say, I need everyone to know I have the power of the budget here, to which you would say under your breath, holy, holy, Holy is the Lord, because the Herods of this world have ceased to be impressive in the vision and in the sight of God. This does not mean that we disrespect and disregard the Herods of this world. Herod has power, but God has more. We are not disrespectful. We respect our parents, bosses, friends, neighbors, co-workers, politicians. We respect them, but we are impressed with God, I believe one of the purposes of coming to church, one of the reasons I believe in bringing our children to church is I need regular reminders of someone that gets up with some kind of unction in their heart and that reminds me, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Micro churches, when you guys gather together, when micro churches gather, we are to be reminding one another when we, we've got to vulnerably lay our problems down because when I'm in those moments of vulnerability and in those places of weakness and in those places of pain, it's absolutely understandable. But don't leave me there. Don't leave me there. Get down there with me. Empathize with me. Hurt with me. Weep with me. But don't just leave me there. I need you to remind me great is the Lord. I want you to, to be with me there when, when, we, when the doctor's report is, oh, it's horrible. And oh, we feel that when someone's mother has died or someone's spouse has died, when someone's walking through the valley of the shadow of death. We, we feel that and we grieve that. But we don't grieve like others. We grieve with an eye for holy, holy, 
Holy is the Lord. Amen. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Stop being impressed with Herod. Start being impressed with God. Number three. Herod is strong, but God is stronger. And we tap into that power when we bathe things in prayer. We tap into the power of God when we bathe things in prayer. Verse 11 says, when Peter came to himself, he, he went out to the house of, he went to the John Mark's mother's microchurch. And it says, they were gathered and they were praying. In verse 5, it says, so Peter was kept in prison, but earnest. Everyone say earnest. It's interesting. I hear a lot of people talk about prayer, and I hear a lot of Christians that pray. What I do not, I, I, on Twitter, I often hear people say, I'm sending my thoughts in prayers. We don't need thoughts in prayers. We need earnest prayer is what we need. I'm not trying to, I'm, I'm really not trying to be legalistic or petty here. I'm, tr- I'm trying to take a word that does mean something. James 5 says, it's the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man that avails much. It's in Luke chapter 22 that Jesus is about to go to the cross and he finds himself in the garden of Gethsemane. And in the garden of Gethsemane with his heart breaking, he's bleeding drops of blood while he prays with intensity that would blow our minds away. And it says he was praying. It's interesting, he's about to go to the cross. You could say, well, just, you, you just gotta go do what you gotta do. No, 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 I want you to notice, even Jesus, before he does what he had to do, he bathed what he was doing in prayer. Well, Jesus died on the cross. Yeah, before Jesus died on the cross, he bathed the dying on the cross in prayer. In fact, in Luke 22, 44, it says, but he prayed more earnestly. It's the same Greek word qualifying the verb pray. He prayed more earnestly. But earnest prayer was made on behalf of Peter by the church to God. See, Herod is strong. God is stronger, but we tap into that prayer, we tap into that power when we bathe things in prayer. So I I really have enjoyed the life of Charles Finney, revivalist that in the 1800s would go and he had unprecedented results in his ministry. He would go into places and he would call people to turn to God, to believe in Jesus, to repent, And just so we're clear, this was fruit that was worthy of repentance, okay? We're not talking about cheap conversions, cheap salvations where people got up out of baptismal tanks and their lives were never the same. He would go into places and bars would shut down, bars that would house men who beat their wives, alcoholism going rampant, alcoholics stopped drinking completely. He went into places that when he was done, prisons got cleared out, and there were no more people in jail for months or years at a time when he would come. He would walk into places, and there was literally times, that like entire business places, they would like, Pit, pit pause, take a two-hour break to do what they called attending to religion to get the, the boss or the owner who didn't even believe in Jesus would say, something's going on. Listen to what this man is saying. And you'd have altar calls, if you want to say it like that, taking place. Just to give you an idea, though, this was during the days of slavery, for example. People would be down on their knees repenting and asking Jesus to be their Lord and King and Savior and leader and forgiver. They would get up, and he would have them sign papers of abolition saying, if you believe in Jesus, you need to be against slavery now. Okay, so we're talking about righteousness and justice coming together. There were legitimate moves of God that should make anyone that loves Jesus make their mouth water. What's interesting, though, is that he would only go to places where first his prayer partner named Daniel Nash would go. Daniel Nash would go in for a while, like a month before, and he would start to to pray and pray and pray and pray. And I'm going to use the term prayer bathing. Now give me some light over here because I've, I, got a, I got a shirt here. And, and let's say I come over here. When I hear a lot of people say, hey, I'm praying about something, this is what I usually know that means. Lord, bless that meeting. Hey, man, could you all be praying for me? I got a really important decision to make. Oh, Jesus, bless John, bless Tom, bless mom, bless mom, right? And, and we... A lot of us, I'm not saying we don't pray. I want to paint you a picture right now and explain theologically. There is a difference between sprinkling things in prayer and bathing things in prayer. There is a difference 
between saying, oh man, I, I prayed about that. I'm not quite sure why nothing happened. And Daniel Nash, who would pray and pray and pray and pray and pray. And by the time Charles Finney got there, Charles Finney was like, would anyone like to come to Jesus? Charles Finney would get up and racist would be like, I don't know why. All of a sudden, I feel like I need to sign papers of abolition. How did he get the kind of fruit that did this? And what I'm telling you is there is something about a man or a woman or a boy or a girl or a church or a microchurch that decides Herod may be strong, but we know that God is much stronger. Why do we see such a disparity in this world of so little God? And the answer is God seeks. The eyes of the Lord are looking across the earth to to and fro across the earth, looking for people to show himself strong on their behalf. And I'll tell you who he does it with, the people that bathe things in prayer. <laughs> Mike, what are you saying? I'm saying, don't fret. Are you, fr are you, is there a situation right now that you're fretting about? Don't you dare fret until you bathe it in prayer. Well, I pray, did you bathe it in prayer? Did you bathe that meeting in prayer? Well, it's a, I work at a secular job. You are a priest of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're a nurse, if you're an occupational therapist, if you're a teacher, I don't, it doesn't matter what you're doing, you do it in the name of Jesus Christ. As surely as I need God to get up here and preach, you need God to go teach those kids at a middle school. You do it in the Bathe that classroom in prayer. Those kids are coming back to school. Go get in that class. Go to that classroom. Get, go ahead. You're welcome to come up here and take one of these and go in that classroom and just be like, man, all right, here it comes. This is what's, oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I got to do that. So, I'm so sorry. I did not even put out a sign. I am so sorry. <laughs> Shamu. If there was the teenagers rolling in one section, consider yourselves teenagers, all right? There it is. <laughs> did you bathe it in prayer? I mean, here's questions I would ask. Did you spend more time praying than, on that project than you spent working on that project? Did you pray long enough to actually listen until you heard something from God? I get tempted to pray, and I'm like, all right, I got to go, go move now. What if God's like, if you will sit there and shutteth upeth, I will talketh to youeth, if you'll listen. Who would like to hear something from God this week? Anybody? See, see Herod is, yes, Herod is strong. Politics are bad. Culture is wacky. COVID's still around. Challenges are real. Oh, there's drama all over the place. But God is stronger. And he manifests himself when we bathe things in prayer. To which I know what some of you are saying. Yeah, I'm not good at this. Neither were they. Did you read the chapter just now? Peter shows up. Rhoda answers. She keeps the door shut. She's like, oh, I don't know what's going on. Like, I'm, I'm not sure what's. She goes in. They're in a prayer meeting at a microchurch. What are they praying about? Lord, free Peter. Set him free. Get him out. Set him free. She says, Peter's here. Guess what all of them said? Shut up. Keep on praying. Lord, I want you to realize if they had faith, they had this much. Their prayers weren't perfect, but their prayers were earnest. God doesn't need perfection. He does want all of our hearts. He, he doesn't want your, your token prayer and then your marathon work. He wants your prayer bath and then your easy yoke. See, he says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. You know you've bathed something in prayer when you've reached the place where the yoke is easy, the burden is light, the peace is strong, and the joy is full. That's when you bathe something in prayer. You're like, oh, I'm, I, I've got this, I feel like I'm striving about, if you're still striving, you haven't bathed it in prayer yet because when you bathe it in prayer, the yoke is easy, the burden is light, the peace is strong, and the joy is full. That's when you bathe it in prayer. So if you're like, oh, we've, we've got these decisions to make. Let me tell you what we do at church. Like at our church, well, part of our strategy in our church is we want to be a house of prayer. But one of the strategy blocks we have goes like this. We bathe everything we do in prayer. That means even in our church, there are things that we've looked at with regrets over even recent years where we realize we did some things on staff, we did some things in our church, and we're like, wait a minute, we did those for God, we didn't do those very much with God because we didn't have time to bathe them in prayer. Here's one of the decisions we made as a church, if we cannot bathe it in prayer, we don't do it. Right now, while I'm preaching, there is a prayer room where there are people bathing you guys and me and us, and you all, 
in prayer. Every minute that I'm preaching, last service, there were people in that room, in our prayer room, bathing. That You say, well, you can pray beforehand. You can. I want all the help I can get. And I, I'm glad there's a prayer engine going on right now to say, we're going to bathe this in prayer. <laughs> Next week, anybody remember Michael Lagones, our old youth pastor? Michael Lagones, he's pastoring a church now up in the panhandle. He asked me to come up and preach for him and speak to his leaders. Next Sunday, I'm going to be up there preaching. I'm going to be asking anyone and everyone, will you bathe my time up at Michael Lagones' church in prayer? And Nona Jones will be preaching here. Will you bathe that in prayer that next Sunday the kingdom is going to come on the earth as it is in heaven? That means, by the way, we look at things like when we make decisions as a church and we're like, wait a minute. Are we able to bathe this in prayer? And if the answer is no, we don't do it. But it's already on the calendar. I would rather constantly take things off the calendar Amen. to only leave the things on. Well, but, but we, we said we were going to do this. Go ahead and say to yourself, I'm only doing things I can bathe in prayer. Don't go on vacation without bathing in a prayer. The best way to raise your kids is bathing them in prayer. Don't just pray for your kids. Bathe your kids in prayer. Well, I'm not good at praying. Neither were they. But they took the time. They bathed things in prayer. See, stop being impressed with Herod. Start being impressed with God. But recognize the power of God gets tapped in when we pray. So here's your application this week. Here's the application. This week, you're going to go through something, and you're going to kind of be stuck. And this is what I want you to do this week. I want you to ask, have I bathed this in prayer yet? That's it. Last night, one of my girls, we had a staff retreat. We had all the families there. We came back. One of my girls said, oh, Dad, i got to go take a shower. I said, why? She said, I haven't been taking showers. I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> she asked the question, have I bathed lately? Before you make that decision, oh, I'm about to take a job. Have you bathed it in prayer? Oh, I'm anxious. You know you've bathed it in prayer. When the yoke is easy, the burden is light, the peace is strong, and the joy is full. And you know you've often not. And here's, here's, the, the, like, here's where I'm repenting to God in a lot of ways. There's so many things I personally, we as a church, have sort of said, God, we, we think it's good. We hope it's you. And we'll slap your name on it, which is different than when you bathe things. In I dare you this week five or ten times to ask yourself, ask your spouse, honey, have we bathed the college decision for our senior in high school? H have we bathed that roommate, two roommates that you love Jesus and you're thinking about taking in a, a third roommate? Oh, they seem good. Have you bathed that? In, do you realize how many troubles God would keep us from if we would bathe our decisions in prayer? Do you realize how many ideas God would give you if you bathed your business in prayer? Let me tell you a story of a guy who did, or who does. Mike Bickle leads what's called the International House of Prayer. For more than 20 years, up in Kansas City, Missouri, which I feel like is like the armpit of America. You know, so it's an interesting place for God to choose to plant something great. Up in Kansas City, Missouri, they planted the International House of Prayer. For more than 20 years, there has been nonstop prayer, literally 24 hours a day, prayer and worship going on at the International House of Prayer in KC. God has moved in a very mighty way up there. Mike Bickle is a very, very humble man, you know, real close to Francis Chan right now, and just a sweet, humble um, powerful man of God. And there was a, a drug addicted, alcoholic, a Muslim guy that somehow ended up in their house of prayer. And, and guys, I, I want to get clear, you know, like even as a church, we, we feel this tension of like, we want people to turn to the Lord. I also want the presence of God. And in and, and a lot of church circles, you sort of hear, well, if you want, if you want your church to grow, or if you want to get hundreds of people in a church, you want a lot of, you kind of got to dumb down all the, the juicy stuff. You got to sort of dumb down the presence of God and all that. And you've just, and, and yet what we want is we want the kind of stuff that like, we want Jesus to do whatever he wants. And we want people to respond when that happens. Well, that happened here in this, this house of prayer where this Muslim guy comes and he ends up turning his life over to Jesus and his entire life changes. He gets off drugs. His life is different and better. His father, who's like a multi-billionaire oil sheik, ends up hearing about this. He's like, son, what's going on? And his son just basically says, dad, will you come to America and will you go to the prayer room? The father comes, goes to the prayer room. The presence of God gets a hold of him and he turns his life over to Jesus as well. <laughs> when he is done with, I mean, gives his life to Jesus, he goes to Mike Bickle and he takes out a checkbook and he's like, listen, you name the amount, I want, I want to write a check. 
And the first thought in his mind was a billion dollars. That's how much money he had, a billion with a B, as in boy, or ballistic, or ba 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 ba, something like that. He says, you named the, you named the check. I want to write you a check because I'm just so thankful for what God's done. To which Mike Bickle says, like Daniel, keep your money. Now, Mike Bickle, he's, he's received checks for $10 million to buy buildings for the house of prayer and all these kind of things. But he's beyond the point of being impressed by that. He says, you keep your money. That would be too easy for you. Instead, go back to your country and tell everybody what God has done for you. And I just hear this story, and I'm like, you know, there's so many things that look so impossible until you take the bath. Church, I want us to bathe things in prayer. I, I'm, I'm calling us. When we get to the end of this chapter, this, this impressive Herod, it says in verse 21, on an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, and he took a seat at, at the throne, and he delivered an oration, and the people were shouting, the voice of a God, and not of a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down, because he would not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. Bam! I just want to say it. As a church, we want to give God the glory. All the glory to him. To him be the glory and the honor and the dominion and power forever. That the name of Greenhouse or the name of Mike or Terry or Billy or Nancy or Mary, all the other names can perish. That one name would be above all the other names. That the wisdom and the honor and the majesty would all be ascribed to the only one worthy who is Jesus. And may I point out that Herod in his pomp built a, a, a big mountain that he buried himself on. And when he was 70 years old, he was getting ill and he was about to die. But he knew, Herod the Great knew that no one was going to be lamenting when he died. And he wanted there to be lament when he died. This is true. This is in the history. So he went and rounded up the elders all around Palestine. And he announced and he ordered that on the hour that he died, they would lock these men up and that they would be killed. A score of them, scores of them would be killed so that there would be lamentation upon his death. And so he was getting ill. They gathered them up. They imprisoned them. And sure enough, he died because the, he wanted there to be lamentation and not celebration when he died. To the, to the fortune of those elders, of course, when he died, everyone's like, hey, the old man's gone. They let him go. I just want to point out the very obvious contrast between the way of Herod and the way of Jesus. Herod goes up on a mountain built by slaves where he's buried. And upon his death, was to bring death for many others. Our Jesus goes up on another mountain called Calvary, on a mountain that was created with his very word, his breath. And upon his death, we receive forgiveness and mercy and redemption and grace and hope and a future and life and power and peace. That when Herod would die, he wanted people dying with him. And that when Jesus died, we would live. And now the name of Herod is, it's a byword because he was. But the name of Jesus was and is and is to come in 10,000 years from now and 10 million years from now. You and I will be getting closer and closer and closer and he will not be less impressive. He'll be more impressive when we realize amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Amazing mercy. Amazing wisdom. Oh, to you alone belongs the glory. And to you alone belongs the honor. And to you alone that, that all the tribes and all the tongues will gather before his throne. And look to him. And look at the one that we pierced with the eyes that flame like fire. And impressed with his power. And yet realizing that it was not the might of his strength that wooed us. It was the gentleness of his spirit and his love that drew us in. Who is like the Lord? Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this sermon, be sure to click that like button. It helps other people find our videos. You can also post a comment about your favorite part of the message. Another way to connect is by subscribing to our YouTube channel. I hope your week is wonderful. Live green.